Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Backstage. Hopefully all is going well for you. This is the time for all of us to be safe, be healthy, take care of each other for sure. And now that school's back in session, we have our family of little ones and medium ones to take care of too. So thanks to our loyalists for being here. To all you people that are new, thanks for being the new loyalist. You're now part of our family and we appreciate it. Of the many people who are in the Con Selmer landscape, there just are some ones that stand out as great friends. And this guest today is certainly one of those for me. We got uh, about four decades of uh, investment in this friendship. Uh, he's had a remarkable career that I'll let him tell you about. Uh, but best of all, he's the gold standard for band directing and music education. Alfred Watkins, welcome. How are you doing, my friend? Hi, Dr. Tim. How are you? I'm doing great down here in Georgia. Tell us what's going on there. What's happening? Oh, we're just trying to get the schools up and back up, either virtually or face-to-face, -face, and trying to decide on whether we're going to have football today or tonight or tomorrow or next week. And uh, that's for the, for the most part. We're still in the throes of summer. Yesterday was 89 degrees, and it was, uh, it was, that was a chilly day for us. We were happy to have the, the heat to go away. So... We're just rounding up band records and having conversations and trying to help get everyone through the day. Yeah. Did they have band camp, Alfred? Most uh, had virtual band camps. Virtual band camp. Yeah. There were a handful that had band camps with social distancing. And I haven't heard that they've had any problems with that so far. Good. Well, tell our, tell our audience about you. Well, my story is pretty simple. Um, and I became a band director kind of through the back door. Uh, the short answer is I'm from a small town, Jackson, Georgia, a metropolis of 3,000 people. And uh, um, I was inspired to play the trumpet uh, and joined the, Trump, joined the band in the, in the sixth grade, like most kids. Came through seventh and eighth, joined the high school band, played in district honor band, tried out for all state band my last couple of years, like any other good band student would. I hung out in the band director's office, who happened to have been a an alumnus of my eventual uh, undergraduate alma mater, Florida A&M University, and kind of guided me into that direction. My school years were 1972 to 1976. My high school years were right in there. And so uh, after high school graduation, I went to his alma mater. Uh, I wanted to be in the famous uh, FAMU Marching 100 band and uh, Joined the band as soon as I, I got there, I found out they paid a huge premium on education, on quality of sound, on pitch, on balance and beauty, and studied the classics, along with some jazz, but it mostly was a classical band director school. And uh, so I had a wonderful four years there with some wonderful teachers slash role models. I was planning on being a professional trumpeter. Uh, I got accepted to the University of Michigan studio of Armando Catala, formerly from the Boston Symphony. I was going to study the trumpet with, as a master's student with uh, Professor Catala. My mother came down with cancer my, early my senior year. So my plans changed. I chose to move back to near my hometown, which was at, it's Jackson, Georgia, about an hour's drive from Atlanta, to be closer to mom, to help her out getting back and forth to the doctor, and whatever she needed with her, with her cancer treatment. And I ended up staying in the band directing profession for 37 years. Uh, first, uh, my first six years were taught literally in the inner city ghetto of Atlanta. Uh, school system of 120,000 students, 22 high schools. The school where I taught was Murphy High School was rated the number 22. Uh, I, I was just a clean cut little country boy uh, and thrown into the inner city ghetto to teach high school band where no kids in the band knew a major scale at all. <sighs> My first day on the job. So we learned a scale. It happened to have been B natural major because one piccolo player could find that note from the music. <laughs> so we learned the B natural major scale. And I stayed there for six years and I learned to, I learned to teach. I learned to take care of the students because it was in, the, in the very one of the very impoverished neighborhoods in the inner city. Uh, where the mel where the mellophone players play mellophone during football during concert season, we put towels over the bells of the instrument, had them to play into the stand 
nasal sotto voce sound push the alto saxes up played in tune got the nightclub alto sax alto blend out of the band and uh had a nice concert band the first year i got real hungry for growth and for excellence after that and the program took off and by the fourth year we were playing howard hansen's chorale and hallelujah and the armenian dances with full instrumentation including superiors and sight reading uh but i learned to teach in that community i learned that if I didn't, what I did not know I needed to learn, and it was my responsibility to give it to my students. If I didn't give it to them, there's a good chance that they wouldn't get it. Yeah. They hadn't done a formalized concert for five years prior to my entrance at all. So I had to turn a program around, but I just wanted to have a band. And I just wanted to make music in class, and I wanted the students to, to love the joy of music making. And that was at the core of my existence. So I, I listened, I studied, I read, I transferred everything I knew to my students, individually and collectively. And that pretty much guided me throughout. And after six years of working there, I was recruited by Bob Coles and Marguerite Wilder and Barry Morgan and Boyd McCowan to teach in the Cobb County School District, which was the exact social, social and the economical, uh, very uh, 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 extreme, yeah, extreme, one to the other. And I use those two words separately because I think we should learn to use those separately. We kind of use that socioeconomic, but one's a social situation and one's an economic situation. And they were both in opposite directions. This transition with the students was quite easy. Started off with a 120 piece band at last of the high school. It's in the second year of existence. I, uh, another band director by the name of George Haddendorf from Ooh, Chesterton, man. Indiana, started off the high school at Lasseter. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I've got a little frog in my throat, excuse me, everybody. And, um, and I picked the band up and we took it off and just flourished and enjoyed, enjoyed every day on the job. Never had a bad day. How long, you, how long were you at, at Lasseter? 31, 31 years. 31 years. Wow. Well, and, and everybody, all you got to do is look at Wikipedia, Lasseter, was at Midwest, they were Bands of America Grand National Champions. I don't think there's any event that you didn't play at at one time or another. Um, and it's, it's just, I mean, you're, you are the reflection of what I talk about. And I, I want you to, just to hit this one for a second. How important were the band directors, your mentors in your life on a one to 10 scale? Nine. They were not a 10 because the theoretical structural education that I got from my, from my undergraduate school counted for a lot. Yeah. It wasn't just motivation. It was a right. learned behavior but between yeah. a nine and a 10 and they were it, particularly being an African American coming through in the fifties, sixties and seventies, Florida and university was a historically black college. So I was able to see myself with, with advanced degrees. I was able to see myself with, with as, a, as a learned individual on the adult standpoint. So that was beneficial. But the band directors, as I mentioned earlier, my first band director guided me to FAMU. And uh, my college band director was, I had two, Dr. Foster uh, and Dr. Julian White, who is still alive. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Foster was the conductor of the ensemble and the leader of the group. Dr. White taught all the methods courses. Mm -hmm. He'd already taught for 10 years very successfully in Jacksonville, Florida. We left Jacksonville and came to Tallahassee. And he taught us everything he knew about how to operate a high school band. My sense of, of, uh, of musical morals, I was taught by my mentor teachers to teach the students musically, socially, and take care of their emotional needs. And, and with that comes the physical need of the child, or in, in, and as we see it nowadays, the health of the child. So all of those are all encompassing for my background, how I was trained, how I was raised, and, and what I believed in. So they were very beneficial. But, you know, the, the, the joke is, you know, Alfred got there just as the band got good. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, that's one way of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> and we know, uh, we, we know people like that. Everywhere they go, just as they get there, the band gets good. Yeah, well, that didn't happen quite that way. But it was, uh, it had all the potentials for having, when I was at last of, the, of having all the, all the, uh, the, 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 uh, the great ingredients is one of those programs where you hear a lot in about suburbia of a major city. That program just has all the potential to be the best in the state. And that meant indirectly, if it didn't, it'd be my fault. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. on you. So I, it just didn't develop. And so having gone in the second year of the school, it was, and I put the first uniform on the kids back. Then I realized that whatever product 
the group was going to have would be as a result of my leadership and my guidance as opposed to someone else's. Yeah. It's a reflection of who's on that box. Given That's what I have since learned, yes. Yeah, well, you're a model for all of us, an exemplar. We're, we're, I'll take a little turn here. We're, we're going through some unusual times, yeah? Um, and I know that there's teachers out there that are just reaching for anything they can. What uh, good advice does the master have for those people? Well, we have, if, if, if we're dealing with this, if we're trying to assist the students musically, socially, emotionally, and now with, with their health or physically, mm -hmm. then if we take those four prongs and make those four prongs a part of our every existence as, an, as educators, which is the, the Latin is to educare. Mm -hmm. The Latin of educate is to educare. And that goes all the way back to undergrad school. I didn't quite believe it until I began to teach. So if you see those four prongs as our responsibility, then our, our choices are very broad. I think in the era of the pandemic, we have to remember that it touches everyone in the world. Mm -hmm. It's not a local flu. It's not a local virus. It's not something that happens in Georgia. It doesn't happen in Indiana. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen in Chicago. It's all over the world. So the whole world suffers and the whole world is crying. And we're all, all looking for answers. One, I think the teachers, if I were in the classroom, my first responsibility would be to their mental health, making sure that they are, that, are, that they feel comfortable, they feel happy, happier than they did the day before and safe. We forget sometimes that, that, that households are impacted by, uh, by uh, COVID-19 differently. Mm -hmm. Someone may have lost an uncle or an auntie and for me to talk about working on a piece of music, when they're struggling with those things, they don't, they don't work. So teachers, students have always had confidence in, that, confidence in their teachers. But the, the flip side of that, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for teachers to learn how to educate, how to, how to find new tools to put in the toolbox and not throw out the old tools. Mm -hmm. And when I was at Murphy, I learned that if I taught one student and taught a second student and a third student, in due time, I'd have a section, as opposed to teaching from the outside in. So the clarinets do this and the flutes do this. So my teaching has always been from the inside out, from one to many, kind of an e pluribus unum kind of a thought process. But each person is important. So, it, so I encourage teachers around me to find new tools to teach the students individually, which is this unit. And we can teach them through lecture, as many of us were taught in, in college through undergraduate school, and graduate school was even more lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, or we can teach them through a series of recordings, or we can teach them through a series of playbacks as applied professors do every day. Or we can teach them through having them to do listening and assessment of a variety of groups. I think, it's, I think it's important that teachers keep the students somewhat account, uh, 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 accountable, not, not gravely accountable. The beginning of school is the beginning of school. The first two weeks are essentially, let's get to know each other for the new ones coming in and for the older ones to get, a, get accustomed to their new positions in the band, which is seventh graders become eighth graders, they are the leaders in the band or the junior step up to become seniors. It takes a couple of weeks or so for everyone to learn, learn new roles. And the academic teachers tend to do review of the previous semester for a week or two. Then they start to move forward. I think with COVID, it's the same thing. The same thing is true for us. We've got a, a long nine-month curriculum. And that first, first two or three weeks probably needs to be a first month. And making sure that everyone's on page. And, every, and we need to know that they're they're bombarded with academia. Mm. Every academic teacher is just trying to get them familiar with their tool, they're moving forward. Some teachers move at warp speed, some teachers are moving slow. And the teachers in the arts have to make sure that we, 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 we hold on to them and let them move slowly, let them talk to each other, let them learn to laugh once again in a Zoom call. I did a call yesterday at, uh, with a uh, uh, School of the Arts in Houston. And it was the beginning of their virtual camp. And within five minutes, I said, okay, unmute yourselves and just give me a laugh. <laughs> and they were, and they were kind of nervous. And I, we unleashed them and let them laugh. And their personalities came through. 
and they start to say hello, hi across the board. And that's what they do every day. So that's the first thing we've got to do is allow them to have an emotional outlet and then get into a a one-on-one -on -one teaching relationship. There, there are tools out there. I'll be brief up the last one. There are tools out there that allow for students to play in quartets real time now, yeah. as opposed to time lag in Zoom. So yeah. that was a long answer for that one question. I'm sorry, Tim. Well, so no, no. When we talk about pedagogy, and <clears throat> that's where we all aim because we're going to get that band really good fast. <clears throat> the environment around it, the climate, the culture. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what what is supporting it. And and from what you're saying and what I've heard from others like you, virtually there's ways to do this, yes? Oh yeah, well, you, you build many communities. Yeah. You build many communities. Uh, at the end of the conversation with the quartet, the, the two that plays quartet, I think it's upbeat music, there are a couple of others, maybe a cappella. when you can do a quartet. Well, let assign them the quartets and, and simple quartets so they can just make music together. It doesn't have to be doesn't have to be a Brahms string quartet rewritten for the saxophone choir. Uh, so they get accustomed to the tool, accustomed to the fact that I'm making music with others and I can still do this. And then you slide practice reports in there and you slide mom and dad in there because they're right over their shoulder in many cases. And the communication from the teacher now to the student can be as much virtual mm. as it used to be written through some email that we send out we get a thousand of them and sometimes they lose personalities. So you can have a virtual session just with the, with the parents of the clarinet section in seven one yeah. for 15 minutes yeah. and give them an idea as to what we're trying to get accomplished and how you can help them. The old kind of Suzuki method of yeah. teaching a child, everything you, you know and you've had in your toolbox, pull those back up and use those. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw one word at you, both as a noun and as a verb and the importance of it particularly at this time, communication? Paramount. Yeah. Yeah. Communication from the teacher to the students and the community with which they live, whether it's all the students, some of the students, sections of students, uh, the whole group, more importantly, the small groups done any number of times. And communication with, with the, the adults in, the, in, in their environment. So they have an understanding as to what you're trying to get accomplished over an arch of a year. And the opposite, the communication from the student to the teacher and how to be able to, or the parent to the teacher, how to, how to, how to get in contact with me when the child is not feeling well or when the child simply doesn't want to practice. You say, it's okay. It's okay they don't feel like practicing right now. Well, they, did you have them practicing a lot last year? They were doing great last year, but something that can't get them to go. So listen, on that standpoint. So it works both ways. So in terms of the communication, I think it's even more critical now. I'll yeah. give you a little quickie, Tim. Yeah. And then it happened by accident. My first few years at Lasseter, I had these large inflows, influxes of students, 200, 220 kids in the eighth grade class that was on the Lasseter. The retention rate was about 40% from eighth grade to ninth grade. Mm -hmm. I called every household of the students that chose not to continue mm -hmm. and ask them why wanted to know that the door was open for them and for them to rethink it it took me a couple of weeks maybe a couple of hours a day uh and i caught i did that for five or six years and the numbers just took off and they grew and that was just the communication the teachers don't want to do that now they want to send them an email but i called every household and got a, a lot of return phone calls. They weren't long phone calls, but I did that starting in 1982. I did it from about 82 to around 90, just to get the mojo going for the cloud I wanted the group to go. It's, it's everything, because communication is the fuel for trust relationships. Trust relationships are what make that kid go, I'll practice extra, because I love Mr. Watkins, and I don't want to disappoint Mr. Watkins and all my friends, because we're on this family together, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, <clears throat> and so particularly since we're using digital technology so much, and you can send them a, send the, send the trumpet section a, a, a videotape masterclass of, of Phil Smith and have them to, to sign in on some kind of a document that you have that they've seen it. Just a little bit of accountability. Mm -hmm. And then you have a section on what just the trumpets talk about Phil Smith and what made Phil Smith sound so exceptional and what weight made Wynton Marcellus's jazz sound so exceptional, as opposed to Roy Eldridge. Or listen to Doc Severinsen 
and how's Doc sound? And just a, and not, oh, I would suggest for you to do this, send it to them as digital. We can find those tools now. And, and that still is a very large part of communication. And you start a different kind of conversation that's music generated in the house as opposed to just band. Well, and it's something we wouldn't have done had this not situation. We, we would not have done it. We, we tend to teach large group work. We teach performance very often yeah. in, the, in the upper middle school and high school grade level. And sometimes we forget music is, is the core of what we're doing. No. Just, uh, I mean, in this last few minutes, the number of, of uh, opportunities and, and, and real pragmatic things you can actually do, not just, you know, all of this up in here philosophy stuff, but you, could, you should be doing these things. They're, I mean, you've given them some tools they can use. Well, a friend of mine in a session about 25, maybe 30, maybe 35 years ago, named Dr. Tim, motivated me by saying, hey, gang, they only get one pass at this. It's our job to give them the best of us when they take this path through our years. Yeah. I took it to heart. Yeah. And if they don't get it, then they're probably not ever going to get it, to be true, honest. Well, we've been dishonest with the ch children. We've been dishonest with ourselves. Yes. We should have a difficult time looking in the mirror when that happens. I know. I'm sorry, I, I digress. But the, <laughs> but the, but the opportunity is, is, is there. One of the things the teachers in the, in, the, in the schools run into, however, are the naysayers in their own building. Amen. Is what the kids can't do because and this year will never be the same. And, and you have to ignore that stuff. Yep. You have to go and say, you know, this is, this is going to be probably our best year ever. Yep. I get to know each kid. I've taught each kid once a week, one-on-one. -on -one. I'll know more about them and their person, their musicianship, their progress, their goals, their goals in music, their goals in life. We're having a ball in the band room. Yes. And that's how that, that begins to bleed into the, in the, into the school. Yes. And that, that negative's contagious. What's that great thing? It says, argue for your limitations and you'll get to own them. And, you know, the that's exactly right. the band director's right. the engine, the band's the train. It's, yeah. The band's not going to go faster than the engine. There's another little debate that I want to share with you. I wrote down uh, uh, last night. <clears throat> we're, we're kind of in a crossroads in the band directing profession. Mm -hmm. We have the pedagogues mm -hmm. and we have ones that we affectionately call the conductors or the wind band conductors. Mm -hmm. they, some of them have even coined a different name for themselves. And I think we essentially, if we want to have greatness, mm -hmm. musically, emotionally, musically, I think both are necessary. I think both are very vital. It's not that the pedagogues don't conduct, and sometimes the conductors, not the college guys, sometimes they don't know how to educate. But whenever I watch, <clears throat> excuse me, Carlos Kleiber conduct the orchestra, or the old Bernstein tapes, they rehearse the musicians. Yes. Jason Fettig rehearses the Marine Band. Yes. And they tell them essentially what they hear, either through gesturing or words, but none of them are muted. Yes. Not a one's been muted in rehearsal. So if they only needed this to get the sounds come forward, they could mute themselves, but they don't. And so I wanted to share that with the, the younger band directors because we've gotten the impression that as long as I can conduct it, it's their responsibility to follow. And part of that is true, but you've got to put something in their minds to follow, right. which is what the, what the great conductors have already always done. Yes. Absolutely. Let me, let me throw another one here at you. <clears throat> Again, I think this has always been important, but at this particular time with the pandemic going on, Alfred, and all that sort of thing, how important is music education and music industry working together? How important is that right now? More vital than ever. <laughs> when I first began teaching, uh, particularly at the last of the years, when there was a lot more a commerce in the community than there were when I taught in the in the other community. My band boosters wanted to do all the advertising and all the communication with businesses around the community, businesses at large. And I would say, well, the, the, the music stores, the music stores, are, that's, that's our corner of the world. And uh, maybe we should stay within our corner of the world because we're all collaborators in this education process. These people that make instruments and have printing companies, they could print anything for a living. They could turn into Simon and Schuster one-on-one, or they can go out and build ventilators. 
So the relationship between the classroom teacher and the music industry is vital because we're in the same community. And the good ones, such as Con Selmer, are committed to providing a great education for, for, for music students and music teachers. And I don't say it just because I'm on this, this situation with Con Selmer, is that through my 44 years after undergraduate background, they have proven to be the, the one of the few that are, that, are, that are serious about assisting in any way that they possibly can. And there are others that do the same thing. The local vendors do, the, do something very similar. So I think it's even more critical, particularly because the economy has shifted so mm. drastically. Yeah. And they can, provide, they can provide tools that sometimes we can't provide for ourselves. Yeah, we either hang together or we hang separately, yes? Yeah. So that's it. Can you tell us just a little bit about your, your, the organization you were talking about before and how many people now are involved and what you're doing? This is just wonderful. Well, Thank you. I, it was formed up in 2011. I did a, a clinic for uh, the DeKalb County Schools here in Atlanta. It's an almost an all-black, well-developed, middle-class school district with terrific powerhouse bands, many of them that played at National Concert Band Festival, state conferences. I did a clinic for them 11 years ago, and at the end of a, it was an end service. It was eight hours a day for five days. Pardon me. Former student of mine is a supervisor of music, Don Roberts. Mm -hmm. So I did it for two or three years in a row. So at the end of the third year, they say, Alfred, let's just put an organization together so we can, we can broaden this out. And so it blossomed then. And it went kind of dormant for about five or six years. But as the, as the world changed for, to, to more digital online things. So when I retired, I looked up and the Facebook group was hanging in there. Mm -hmm. So we got the Facebook group for Minority Band Directors National Association. It's a collection of ethnic minority band directors throughout the country and the world, mostly the US, Caribbean, and in certain parts of Africa, but ethnic minorities. Uh, they're calling very carefully to make sure that they're band directors before they, they can join and sign in, not band lovers. I love them, but that's not, this is a professional organization. Our membership now is 1,800. Whoa! 1,800 uh, band directors of, that are of ethnic minority grouping uh, with a few, few uh, uh, other friends and colleagues sprinkled in. And we use it as, I call it the Jet Magazine Facebook of the country. Jet Magazine was an all-black magazine that for viewers aren't familiar with. It was a little small weekly periodical that came out of Chicago in the 1950s. And it carried the news from coast to coast in the black community because there was no other vehicle to do that. And so if it wasn't in Jet, it wasn't true from Maine to California. And so this is intended to, 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 our organization intended to serve, promote, mentor, and celebrate ethnic minority teachers throughout the country. So it's a tool for, so whenever something happens, great. This person gets a new job. This person finishes a master's, this person finishes a doctorate. This person goes to this event. Then it's a good news share. It's also a lobbying group, a, a group, a place where people can come in and vent whatever frustration they may happen to have from time to time. And it's a sounding board. Uh, and it's, it's turned into a great, a great organization that Con Selmer has helped us out with on any number of occasions. We had a convention two years ago. We were scheduled to have a convention last year, but Corona got in the way, and I don't know what's going to happen this year, depending on the schools. This summer, we had seven Zoom sessions. Wow. Uh, seven two-hour Zoom sessions with the best of the best in the industry, most of which were, were ethnic minority, which included Otis Murphy and DeMondre Thurman and Kenneth Tompkins, principal trombone in, 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 in Detroit Symphony, to Scotty Barnhart, leader of the Count Basie Band. Winter Marsalis came in for a two-hour visit. Uh, and then Chris Martin came in. Julian Bliss did a session from Great Britain at 12.30 uh, uh, a.m. And just and we had eight of them, and uh, and we had a band director marathon that we're very proud of, which was a back to school marathon. It was twelve hours. We took we just we defined it out. We just we uh, designed it after the old Jerry Lewis telethon. Yeah, you just kind of peeped in when you wanted to peep in, you peeped out when you didn't want to, and it was very successful. We had about three thousand people on those calls. It was on social media as well. So mm -hmm. we're excited because it's just in the early stages of developing. And uh, that's, that's his, it's his purpose. You're running at top speed. I think you're the only band director I've ever known 
that went to the Macy's Day Parade and the Rose Parade in the same year. Completely accidental. Had no intention. We applied to both of them with the hopes of getting into one <laughs> and got into both of them. And uh, I knew we couldn't afford to do them both. So I called them both independently and asked, could they delay our in application for a year? And they both said no and never apply again if you do. <laughs> so we went back and we put it on bid and it, it wasn't too bad. It was about the cost of a trip to Europe uh, and it wasn't too bad. And my community band, the Codwin Symphony, is going to, into its 22nd season. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Started it off about halfway through my teaching career. Um, well, you got there just as everything got good, didn't you? I mean, <laughs> the last question I have, well, first of all, any advice to our friends before we wrap this up? And this is going so fast. Yes, just um, believe in yourself, believe in music, mm. and believe in the, in the joy of music, and be creative, and, and more creative, and more creative again in order to communicate your your musicianship to your students and they can grow musically socially emotionally and now from a health standpoint a wellness standpoint and i think all those are critical so uh, but don't give up the ship this mm -hmm. won't last forever when we get back together you'll find that your students are probably going to be wiser brighter yeah. and possibly even stronger than they were we taught this large subject that we called the band yeah, I think you're right. Just a very uh, last uh, favor. Will you come back and visit us again on backstage? You call out answer, as always. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, your dear friend. I love you. Tell the family I said hi. Thanks for being here with us. And to all of our watchers, it was a home run today, wasn't it? This is a grand slam. Thanks, Thanks Alfred. For, thank you, Tim. Bye-bye. Blessings. Thank you. Same to you.